Every once in a while, I get a crazy lead on something I just have to follow up on. And a couple of days ago, Alex, my weapons expert, called to tell me he's got something I'm going to love lined up across the pond. But it's really super secret. So I hopped on a plane, and I'm here in London. Alex has a long-standing relationship with an antique arms and armor dealer here in London. And we're going to go in there. We're going to take a look. Maybe I'll buy something. Maybe I won't. But it's going to be a fun day. Rick, meet the finers. Um, Peter's the father. Rolly and Red also work with him, much like I work with my father. And in fact, Peter and my father have been friends for about 40 years. So I've known this family a long time. From the looks of it, you definitely have some incredible stuff here. If you follow us through into our back room, some of the rarest pieces we have in our back room. So that's where you keep the good stuff. The better <laughs> stuff, yeah, yeah, yeah. Follow me. All right. The business is a family business which was started um, over 50 years ago by my father. Essentially, we deal in arms and armor from Roman and Greek times um, all the way through to the 19th century. We were excited when Alex called. We we're very happy to, to see them. We certainly knew we had some pieces which um, might interest them. Oh, so this is where the real fancy stuff is at. A lot of the pieces here have um, fascinating provenance, some of which is royal. One of the pieces I'd like to show you guys is this pair of pistols here by John Christie. That is some crazy work. Made in Scottish style by a Scot, but made actually in his own private workshop in the Tower of London. George III commissioned John Christie to come down from Scotland to make dress pistols and such like for diplomatic gifts. You'd never fire anything like that. No, they weren't really designed to fire. They were designed to look good out of, in basically informal wear, right? Although they were completely functional. Sure. No maker would ever make a pair of pistols, you know, unless they were purely mm -hmm. functional. Interestingly, they have a proof mark just here, which is actually the private Tower of London proof mark, which was mostly done for royal pieces. Okay. What are they made out of them? I'm assuming steel barrels. They're, what is the they're all steel, and then these are gilt brass stocks. Very unusual, very, very rare. They have a wonderful, grotesque face on the, on the butt of the pistols there. And all of this, is, how is all of this work done? Is this it is engraved? all engraved, chiseled and engraved, yeah. Can I pick one up? Yeah, sure. It makes you feel royal. <laughs> yeah, that's just amazing. And the style of these pistols is traditionally Scottish. It's purely Scottish. You don't find all steel pistols anywhere else, really, in the world. That is pretty incredible. What's that one right there, the ivory one? It's not ivory, no, that's staghorn. So this is um, made in 1600, and it's made for the Saxon court in Germany. It's one of only a few that have ever come onto the art market. This is a walnut stock that's inlaid with staghorn, and then the decoration is dogs and grotesque faces, chasing rabbits and so on. So that, that's a wheel lock? This is a wheel lock, about 1600 in date, yeah. And wheel locks typically are quite a bit bigger. They are. That's probably a, a half scale. So the, the purpose of making it smaller was probably for a boy or Probably a for a boy, yeah. Hey, check this thing out. It's beautiful. What's really interesting about the mechanism is you wind it, and this is a tightly wound spring that starts, once you let it go, it starts to spin, and there's a little door here. That door opens up and creates sparks. So the wheel's spinning, the pyrite's touching down on it, it goes and all the sparks come up, which lights the priming powder, which fires the gun. Extremely complicated. I incredibly complicated. How many did you say? Three? I no? believe only three have ever come onto the art market. <laughs> yeah. So how much is the wheel lock? The wheel lock's 140,000 pounds. Okay. Um, I think I'll pass on this one, but how much are these? They're 100,000 pounds. 100,000 pounds? Yeah. And they tick all the boxes. They have a great name, or, you know, great maker, great condition. And, and they're beautiful, they're works of art. So would you take 80,000 pounds for them? No, Rick, I wouldn't, wouldn't take 80,000 pounds, but I would take 90,000 pounds for them. <sighs> would you take 85,000? That's like $105,000 American. I'll take 85,000 pounds, you have a deal. All right, all right. <laughs> 
just bought those. Oh well, yeah, I bought them. You just bought those. <laughs> <Some pounds. laughs> I mean, they're fantastic. I'm thrilled. Well, thanks for bringing me here. They're absolutely amazing. Appreciate the business. Sweet. Thanks a lot. Cheers. All right. I shouldn't be in here any longer. I might buy something else. I might want to stay, though. <laughs> hey, how can I help you? I'd like to try and sell this Colt revolver. This is cool. Do you know much about it? I know it's an old piece. I want to say 1800s. This is a very early Colt single action army. This was, uh, this is 1870s. And everyone wanted them. And they also had the world's greatest advertising campaign. God made all men, and Colt made them all equal. <laughs> I came down to the pawn shop today to sell my Colt revolver. I don't know much about Colt revolvers. Mine looks old, and I'm hoping it's worth a lot of money. If I'm able to sell the revolver today, I'll probably just take the family on vacation, maybe a cruise or something. The Colt Single Action Army really was just incredibly revolutionary. I mean, this, this was the most high-tech thing around in the 1870s. Before this, it was, you've seen the old movies, them, you know, packing the guns with gunpowder and putting a ball in this. This had cartridges. This was super accurate. This had interchangeable parts. This shot straight. It didn't break. I mean, it was just a high quality gun. And this is an incredible set of grips. You have a Federal Eagle here. You have the shield, the lances. These were twice as much money as any other comparable gun to them. This is the dream gun of every Colt collector. If you have ever seen a Western, you've seen this gun. I want this thing, I want this thing, I want this thing. But I have to make sure everything checks out. So where did you get this thing? I'm a bail bondsman, and somebody put it up for collateral, and they never paid off the bond, so they surrendered it. There's an appraisal on it. I took it in for $25,000. That's what they owe. That's what I'd like to get. OK. Um... And they're saying an obvious factory reversal of the numbers. It's often the case with arms engraved and nickeled. So you want 25000 for this? Yeah. Do you mind if I have someone take a look at this thing? I mean, I just have a lot of questions on the gun. I mean, it's really weird that you have two serial numbers on the gun. But if everything checks out, maybe we can make a deal. Great. Okay. Hang out five minutes, I'll get him down here, and um, we'll go from there. OK. I'm a little excited and a little nervous to hear what the expert has to say. He might devalue it. Then again, he might increase the value of it. Oh. Um, wow. It's a pretty neat gun. <sighs> My big fear with things like this is usually when it's too good to be true, it's too good to be true. What do you think? I mean, at first look, it's, it's gorgeous. What's really nice about this is this is a known pistol. This has been in two books, and one of them is the Colt Bible. So it's a single action army, seven and a half inch barrel, which was the standard cavalry length. The single action army changed everything. I mean, this is the gun that won the West, also known as the Peacemaker, the Colt 45. I mean, this started it all. Cool. The grips are the thing that makes everybody go, wow. You see this here, this high relief? These are Civil War scenes. Colt didn't make that grip. Uh, there was a retailer, the largest retailer of firearms in the United States was Schuler, Hartley, and Graham. This style grip is extremely rare. It, you see it more on older pistols, percussion pistols, but on a single action army, this grip is, these are hen's teeth. All right. But there's some really weirdness with the serial numbers. <laughs> Most Colt collectors go, I want all matching serial numbers. Uh, but I think it's a pretty fair assessment to say, look, these were hand stamped. They were making them thousands and shipping them out, and that could just be a simple mistake. It could drive the value down a bit, but there's so much right about this beautiful gun that, you know, for me, it, I would still want it. So we have an 1876 really fancy Colt. You got a piece of magic here. OK, so what is this piece of magic worth? I will say that at auction, I would safely guess that this would sell for 35000 If it went above fifty, dollars it wouldn't really surprise me. Wow, I was thinking it was going to be a little bit less than that, but I'm not surprised. I mean, it's a beautiful piece. <sighs> OK. 
Okay, well, thanks, man. You are welcome. Appreciate it. Okay, thank you. This gun is an excellent buy for the shop. The model is known as the Peacemaker, but if Rick can get a good deal, it'll be known as the Moneymaker. All right, so 25, no problem. Amy, what's your best price? You give me 40,000, I walk out the door. No, you're, you, if at 40,000, you're walking out the door with the gun. Even though you can sell this for 55, 60,000 here. No, 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 he says maybe. 35. I go 26. 27,500. Gun's yours. We got a deal. Great. I'll meet you right over there. Honey, pack your bags, because I'm taking this 27,500, and I'm going to take the whole family on vacation. What is this? This is a model 1894 Marlin. This is like the nicest Marlin you could order out of the catalog, period. Just, a, just about. This is an amazing looking gun. I purchased this gun from a guy, believe it or not, who was 88 years old. I saw this gun when I was 14, and I didn't get this gun until about five years ago. So that's definitely a long chase. You don't see guns that custom, that old. This is probably the best of the best that you can get. Marlin, the guy who owned this company originally, worked for Colt, right? Correct. Every great gun company in the United States in the 1800s either worked for Colt or Winchester at one time. The two big ones. I know they became really huge in military contracts during World War I. Um, they were like the number one manufacturer of machine guns. That's some pretty amazing engraving on this thing. Yeah. You got platinum and gold on the trigger. Up on the barrel, you also have some gold inlays and uh, platinum inlays there. Special wood, special sights, case hardened frame, shotgun butt. This gun's got like nine extra features on it. I mean, yeah, it does look to me like if you ordered it out of the catalog, you checked every box. See the order form now? I want that, I want that, I want that, I want that, I want that. God, it's that much. I want that. <laughs> Just looking at this gun, you can tell someone spent a hell of a lot of time on it. I mean, this gun is top notch, right down from the gun itself to the amazing engraving. To say I'm interested would be an understatement. It's a great rifle. The action's still good. Yeah, I had to have good eyes to look through there. Yeah, yeah, I'm just seeing blur. <laughs> <laughs> oh, how much were you looking to get out of? I'm looking for forty-one thousand. You do have some little condition issues, with, oh, which would be a big thing on a gun like this. We got a nasty gouge right here. You, know, you take a gun like this, you start digging it up and scratching it. It's not dollars that it's going away. It's thousands of dollars that are going away. I'm thinking like 20000 I I think that's a fair price on the gun. It's a big drop from 41 21000 I take the gun. I take all the risk. I'm the one who's got to resell it, and you walk out here with money. 28500 21000 That's the best I will go on it. 21000 I got to make money. $25,000. $21,000. I'm sticking to my guns. <laughs> oh, boy. The money sounds nice. I think I'll do it. OK, we got a deal, man. I'll meet you right up front. I'll, we'll write this up and just a bit work. I think we could have done better. Definitely going to miss this firearm. You don't come across these guns too often. We'll put the money into another nice gun. He definitely got a good deal. Earlier, a guy brought in a beer gun. It's literally one of the coolest guns I have ever seen. I really want to shoot and maybe even buy this gun, but I have to be 100% sure when it was made. So I called in the guy with all the answers, Mark Hall Patton. This is nice, a beer. -a. It was named for the king of Nepal. It's a Nepalese gun. It was actually developed by a general, Gehendra Shamshur Jang Bahadur Rana. How and in the hell could you ever remember that? <laughs> I can remember that sort of thing. But what happened was, at the, in the late 19th century, Nepal wanted a machine gun. There were ongoing problems between Nepal and China, Nepal and, and Tibet, Nepal and India, and, and they knew that machine guns were coming out, and they wanted a machine gun. England actually ended up being the first country to recognize Nepal as a separate country. 
And so Nepal ended up being an ally of England. They ended up giving them a couple of million rounds of Martini Henry 577 450 cartridges. They were terrible rounds, so what do you do with them? If they don't work well, you give them to Nepal. And Nepal said, well, we got to do something with them, and General Gehendra developed this. I've seen pictures of this gun before, but I've never seen one in person. To be able to see this one today is really interesting, and it's in beautiful condition. This is an amazing piece. What's your concerns on this? So this was definitely made in 1896 or 97. If it's after 1898, I can't buy it legally. Yes, they were only made in 1896 and 1897. All right, sweet. Those are the only two years that they were produced, so they're completely legal to own. They are not considered a class three firearm because it is not a machine gun like we think of machine guns today, where you hold down the trigger and it keeps reloading and firing. This fires only with each crank. Cool. Yeah, it is an amazing piece. Are you planning on shooting this? Yeah. We're going to take out the firing range in the morning and meet up with Alex. You want to come? Yeah. You mind? Yeah, no problem. Oh, I'd love to see this thing shot. I will get some guys to help you load this. Oh, great. We appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. All right, no problem. It weighs about 1,100 pounds. <laughs> I'm pretty excited to go out to the firing range. I think once he starts cranking uh, that mechanism and it starts firing, uh, he's, he's going to be sold on the gun. The Vera gun. This thing's sweet, Rick. I love this Vera gun. It, it's so heavy and big, and it's got these giant screws holding it together. It really does look like something that came from a mythical mountainous kingdom. So. Here's what the beer gun is. The Nepalese, a man named Gehendra, was able to smuggle in American Gardner gun out of England into Nepal, and he attempted to reverse engineer the American Gardner gun, and it became the beer gun. But he made some radical changes. I mean, the most notable change is that pan magazine. Now, this pan magazine holds 120 rounds of this ammunition, which I brought today. This is a Martini Henry ammunition. Look at the size of that round. When that's fully loaded, it weighs 40 pounds, just the pan magazine. Whoa. So Gehendra decided, unlike a Gardner gun that you actually push, he designed this crank to pull. And his theory was that it wouldn't fatigue the soldier firing it over time. So in essence, he could be there all day, and he would be able to pull it longer than he could push it. The jury's still out on that. It is tremendously unique, and I have never seen one fire. Who's first? That's why I'm here. OK, you're the guinea pig. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> On this thing, I'm happy to be. I got a tourniquet and a med kit, so if anything goes wrong, <laughs> we're, we're ready. Good. We're ready. Everybody got their protection on? Good, good. Well, if it blows up, I'll take care of your wife. <laughs> <laughs> I'm stepping back. All righty. I've never loved a gun so much. You got to try it down. This is sweet. <laughs> this gun is amazing. When you are cranking that, you can feel every click, every tooth engaging in it. It's a really interesting gun. All right, here we go. Target. This thing is absolutely great. This gun is awesome. I mean, really, it's that cool. It looks really, really steampunk. It looks really neat. It looks really weird. It's a great showpiece. What's it worth? Well, uh, a few have been sold over the last couple of years. The market value for these is about 27500 OK. So what's your best price on this thing? I'm asking 30000 <sighs> OK, he just said they go for right around 27000 OK. And it takes a tremendous amount of real estate on my showroom floor. I'll give you 18 grand for it. I can't do 18 grand. How about 26? 
the fact of the matter is I gotta resell this thing. And quite frankly, there's not a lot of people that are gonna come in my shop every day. Hey, do you have one of those beer guns from the Himalayas? 20,000 is the most I can do. It's the most I can pay and still makes sense, plain and simple. I can do 20,000. All right, sweet. I am like a kid in a candy store. This is like one of the coolest guns I've ever bought in my life. I just have to test it a few more times. <laughs> I could do this all day long. I think you're out of ammo. Aw, oh, crap. So a customer came in with a French Boutte shotgun from the 18th century. This thing is absolutely amazing. Any gun collector would absolutely love this. But I need to know what I'm getting into. So Alex, my gun expert, is coming by, and he's going to let me know if I should take a shot. What do you think? Holy moly. Can I pick it up? Please. This is stunning. So Boutte was the gunsmith in France in the 18th century and into the beginning of the 19th century. He was so good that he was the royal gunsmith to Louis XVI, who was the final king before the revolution. And not only was he his gunsmith, but Napoleon made him his gunsmith. So the guy had a long career as basically the finest gunsmith, certainly in France, but many people would argue in the world. Okay. Let me just see the... So it's it's about probably a 50 or 60 caliber, which doesn't really mean anything in shotgun terms, but for people like today, you would say this is about a 20 or 22 gauge. It's muzzle loading, it's flintlock. I'd like to just see the... Oh, yeah. So what I'm doing there is just making sure that the springs are still good, and they certainly are. Yep, and so it's a double trigger. So one trigger fires one cock, the other fires the other. So you see boutets in some of the finest museums in the world. There's a series of boutets at the Met in New York. They are all over Europe. So basically what we may have here is a one-off piece by one of the best French gun makers of all time. The best French gun maker of all time arguably the best gun maker in history. Okay, um, any idea what it's worth? So simple boutets will start easily about $10,000. Okay. One like this, on a scale of one to 10 as far as decorative, this is about a six. So they get very, very decorative. The one thing I'd like to do is I'd like to test it. If it fires how I believe it would, I'd be more comfortable evaluating it. Do you mind meeting us out at the range with it so we can test it out? Sure. And we'll meet you out there, okay? See you at the range, man. Yep. Let me grab a piece of paper. I'll write down the address for you. Awesome. I think my wife would get really mad if I came home and said, I saw a really nice bootay at work today. <laughs> Hello, boys. Hey. So the bootay looks all polished up and ready to go? The bootay <laughs> is shiny, yeah. One of the things I have found in this direct sunlight is actually the barrels are also marked. So this barrel is marked bootay, and then the other side, it's marked manufactured in Versailles, and it has a serial number 322. So that actually might be traceable, which is really nice to see on the barrels. So All right. That's an added bonus. I brought some shot. I've got some triple F black powder. We're going to load about 50 grains, which is a pretty light load for this, but just to be safe with it. And uh, I set up some uh, fruit targets. Let's do this. This shotgun is like a piece of art. Typically, I wouldn't fire this gun, but collectors search for firearms like this. And if it's successful, uh, I do think it'll help the value. All right, so I think I should shoot it? I'll, I'll shoot it. I have waited half of my life to shoot a bootay. Let me try it. Alex is going to shoot it. OK. All right, here we go. There we go. That was good. <laughs> <laughs> so it fires, it works, it's, yeah, everything's it, perfect on it. It functioned exactly as it should function. 
And I'm not surprised because Boutte is the finest gun maker of all time. What do you think it's worth? I think if this went to auction in this condition, I wouldn't be surprised to see it sell up for 30000 Damn. That much? It's really nice. Do you see the smile on my face? <laughs> All right, well, thanks, man. I'll talk to you later. Very welcome. And it was a pleasure, Dennis. Thank you for letting me fire it. My pleasure. All right. Nice See you guys. You. Good luck. Take care, bud. All right. So you were asking 10. I'm assuming you want a little bit more now? No. I want a lot more. <laughs> All right. 20. I think that's a pretty fair offer. I'll give you 15 grand for it. 18. OK. I'll tell you what, I'll give you 16 grand for it. And normally I'd pay you a little bit more, but something like this, I'm not gonna see money back for a year or two. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna be on the level with you. It's, it's a lot more than I thought I would get. We'll do 16. All right, sweet. All right, All right um, bring it back to the shop. We'll do some paperwork and uh, I'll get you paid. So, I now own a fine bouquet. Not that I haven't always had one. Well, it took you 50 something years to get one. <laughs> Hey, how's it going? Well, I was in a while ago. I sold an item to you guys, some crabby old bald-headed guy. You look like an honest guy, but I still don't trust you. <laughs> Must have been my dad. Oh, how nice for you. Couldn't agree with you more. <laughs> what do we got? This is an 1838 Colt Patterson pistol. Who are you, Pistol Pete? I am not Pistol Pete. That sucks. <laughs> I'm a military and gun collector. I swap, buy, trade a lot of different guns. This was the first gun built by Samuel Colt. I'd like to get $15,000 for this gun. If pressed, I could probably go as low as 12,000. So what's so special about this gun? Now, before this gun, the only real reliable guns out there were the single shot cap and balls. This was the first successful repeating gun. Yeah, this was the very first one that used a rotating cylinder for a single barrel. The cool thing about this particular piece is that this gun belonged to William R. Manning, who was a Civil War colonel. It's got William R. Manning's name engraved on it, on the uh, grip there. Buffalo Bill got this gun from him at some point, returned it to his daughter, May Manning Lilly and her husband, who was Pawnee Bill. Forgive me, I don't know who Manning is. I know who Peyton Manning is and Eli Manning. That's about <laughs> it. <laughs> they have to be direct descendants. I mean, I'm, I'm certain. <laughs> I don't know who this Manning is, but Pawnee Bill was a Western showman that did work with Buffalo Bill. We're talking about some of the most iconic figures in the Wild West. If it checks out, we got a major fine here. I think it's easily worth every penny of $15,000 in this condition with this story? You know, it very well could be, my man. Uh, it all goes down to condition and serial numbers. And after all that, I mean, I have to be pretty cautious because last one of these I had come in was actually fake. Mind if I have a buddy of mine come down and check it out? Because, like I said, I can't give you a price on it. He's not one of those college pukes, is he? I'm sure he is. He's got that college boy look about him. No, that would be great. I hope this college puke that they're bringing in doesn't tell me this gun is fake. I'll be quite disappointed. All right, here we go, man. Colt Patterson pistol with some Buffalo Bill stuff attached to it. Wow. It's a nice piece. Yeah, uh, absolutely. It's the gun that started it all. This was yeah, the very nice. first percussion revolver. Right. Colt chartered new territory with the development of the Colt Patterson. They made about 1,000, and I would guess there are probably 100 left. They're very, very rare and very, very valuable. What's the story with Buffalo Bill? This gun originally belonged to a William R. Manning, okay. who was a colonel uh, with the 50th Artillery Regiment from Georgia during the Civil War. He was a Confederate? He was a Confederate. Okay. Buffalo Bill got this gun from him at some point, returned it to his daughter, May Manning Lilly, and her husband, who was Pawnee Bill. It's pretty much laid out here. Buffalo Bill is a big name in history, and if you've got a gun that can be even tangentially related to him, you're talking a lot of money. The box, I have no doubt, was sold by this family, mm -hmm. and I have no doubt there was a gun in it. Mm -hmm. The question is, was this the gun in the box? I see. It does look like old engraving. Um, another thing you have to look at is the type style. 
Is this, a, is this a modern font or is it an antique font? Okay. The engraving does look old, so I'll, I'll give you that. Okay, Corey, what are your concerns? Had fake ones come in before. You've had fake Colt Pattersons yes. come in. Okay, yeah, there are fake Colt Pattersons. Once you add the whole Buffalo Bill thing to it, I just at a complete loss of what to even offer the guy. Ah, there's a characteristic to the Colt Patterson. The barrel is, okay, the barrel's seven and a half inches long. Were they standard at seven and a half inches now? They made them seven and a half inches and they made them nine inches. This is a standard barrel length, which is good. Now, we talked about this being an early gun. Let's look at the serial number. The serial number will appear usually in two places and they're sort of hard to find places. Pull the barrel off for me. I don't want to be the one that breaks this thing after, you know, there you go. Okay. Yeah, the first serial number is going to be right there. You got it there and let's see what it says. And the serial number is two. Whoa, two. Is that good? Uh, well, let me put it this way. What's the most expensive pistol ever sold in America? I don't a know. A Colt Patterson, <laughs> million dollars. Great condition, I mean, it, it looked brand new. If this gun is serial number two, it's the second Colt ever made. It's priceless. Do you know what this gun is worth regardless of its condition if this is number two? This is a really big deal. Okay. I mean, it's a really big deal. Let's look around for more serial numbers. Uh, there's usually one under the grip. And the number is bigger than two. <laughs> How much bigger than two? 936 numbers bigger than two. Oh, man. Don't be disappointed. This is still a rare gun. You know, very shortly after this gun was made, Colt went bankrupt. Yes. One of the things that one of Colt's partners did was that he decided to recover his investment by sort of taking inventory and selling it. And what he did is he continued to assemble and sell Colt Pattersons. Okay. And my opinion is, is that's one of these. Okay, Colt went out of business. Yes. His partner grabbed all the boxes of inventory off the shelves and just started mix matching guns and putting them together. Stuffing things together. Basically. Uh, yeah, this doesn't become an undesirable gun. It just means it's got mismatched serial numbers. Okay. That being said, what's it worth now? Um, okay, the condition of the gun is what I would say is maybe poor plus, but there are probably about 150 to 200 Colt Pattersons that even still remain. And that you have a, a story which I tend to believe. In other words, the totality of the package here to me says that the story is probably true. Okay. Um, so that he was a colonel in mm -hmm. the Confederate Army, that's a big deal. Buffalo Bill connection, big deal. With everything I've seen, positives, negatives, uh, I'm probably going to say 25. 100? 1,000. OK. Yes. Thank you, sir. May I ask what you're asking? More than I was when I brought it in. I'll just say, not knowing that number, pay the money. OK. Pay the money. You're not going to get another chance. Appreciate it, man. Take care. Well, it's not number two, but it's still a Colt Patterson. There were less than 1,000 of these guns made, and that means something. It means that it's a very rare gun. Well, you heard what he had to say. What do you want for the gun? I was asking 15. How about 19? I'm thinking more in the 12 range. Oh, God. Let's see. I bring in a gun, and you want to rob me? <laughs> uh, I just, 12 is, no, 12 is way too low. Give me another number. I'm not paying 19 for the gun. OK. Uh, how about 17? How about we go back to what you originally wanted for it, and I'll give you 15. 15, huh? Oh, geez. Yeah, All I right, can do yeah. 15. Johnny will write you up. I'm walking out of here with $15,000 green, and I'm going to use it for my collection to get something I really want. Earlier, a guy brought in a black powder peg leg gun that he says is from the early 1800s. Corey thinks it's some kind of movie prop, but I'm hoping it's legit. So I brought in my buddy Alex to help me out with this thing. I mean, I'm looking at this thing, and frankly, I'm stumped. <laughs> we have the Swiss Army knife of pirate legs. <sighs> I mean, intrigued is an understatement. Let me see this thing. So this is a peg leg with a gun in it. Wow. 
look at this thing. I have never seen anything like a peg leg with a flintlock in it, ever. This thing is insane. So, want me to tell you if I think this is real? Yeah, I just can't yeah. see this being a viable option for somebody. All right, well, here's what I know. The lock, it's got the crown GR for King George. King George died in 1820, so that's period for sure. But that cloth on there is... Yeah, well, that's a machine stitch all yeah. the way across. Huh. Ah, man, this is tough. So is it real? Well, I don't think it's a movie prop. I think it's much too sophisticated for it. I mean, it looks like it would function. Nice. Right? Nice. Sweet. Here's the thing. This barrel is rifled. So if I was going to make a movie prop, why would I bother putting a rifle barrel in it? Rifling is a twist that's grooved into the inside of the barrel. And what it does is it takes a pistol ball and it spins it, sort of like a football spins on a spiral and goes straighter. So if you're going to make a movie prop, why use a rifle barrel? Just use an old piece of pipe. What would happen is if this was a British officer's leg and he was injured in battle, you're out to sea for months. Maybe the ship's carpenter made this. And they use recycled materials from products that they had on the ship. <laughs> Wow, these are um, pipes for the ramrod in a brown best musket. It's kind of an ingenious design because, you know, if you had a pant on and the bottom of your pant came down to the ankle, you'd have no idea that there was a pistol in there. So if you were in the middle of a battle, you need only bring up your leg that far and boom. Awesome. Right? Awesome. Boom. You just pull this little lever and the pistol discharges. So he wants 15 grand for it. I can't answer that yet. You know, I got to research it, and if it fires, that'll help the value a lot. Can you meet us at the range in the morning? Sure. All right, I'll see you tomorrow, guys. See you tomorrow. Take care. If Alex wants to shoot it at the range, I think that will do nothing but help the value go up. I'm all for it. What do we strap this to to shoot it? <laughs> His leg. <laughs> sort of like shooting like a handheld rocket. It's kind of big and cumbersome, but we'll see if it works. All right. I chose some targets, some cantaloupes, because this is a close-range weapon. There's no way to aim this. You just sort of point in the general direction and pull the lever and hope for the best. Load up the leg. <laughs> <laughs> I'm being conservative with this gun because I don't want an accident to happen. I'm using a little bit of powder and a smaller ball. Little pressure, less of an accident. Lots of pressure, big accident. So I'm going little. <sighs> All right, here we go. You ready? All right. <laughs> yes! Got a hit. Went right through it. It fires. Yes! Now I've done my job, and it's between Rick and the cell. Does anyone else want to fire it? Sure, I'll shoot it. <laughs> nice. You don't want to shoot it? No, not at all. Why not? some sweaty pirate leg <laughs> was in there, and I'm just not into it. So I'll let you go ahead and do it. All right, Rick. All right. All right. Ready? Here we go. I got a flesh wound. I got a flesh wound. <laughs> it fires. It's legit. I want to get it for the right price. I really want this thing. It is really cool. It's one of those things I put in the shop. People will want to take pictures next to it. What do you think it's worth? Well, there's no other peg leg gun out there to compare it to, but it really works and it has an ingenious design. So what crazy collector out there wouldn't want this? I would say probably somewhere in the twelve to $15,000 range. Awesome. It's pretty amazing, Rick. I've never seen something like this. Well, thanks, man. I appreciate You're it. You're welcome. Good luck, Alex, Dennis. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. So what would you take for it? I'm looking at 15. No, 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 no. There's, there's no money to be made. Come back at me. Eight grand. 10. We go nine? This is a thing that looks great in the showcase. I think I might, might be able to find some crazy guy to give me a lot of money for it, but it's going to sit around for a long time. Call it nine and a half. It's 
political difference. 9,500, 9, you got a deal. It's one of the coolest things I've ever owned. Rick and Corey were laughing when I first came in here. I'm the one that's laughing now with a pocket full of money as I hop on my one leg out of here. It's one of the weirdest things we ever bought. Well, I know it's weird, but that's why it's so great. I mean, I'm just telling you, if you're 12 years old, would you think that was the coolest thing in the world? No. You're so lame.